So David, with all these amazing techniques, uh, do you think that anytime soon we're actually going to be able to measure gravity waves? Well, this is a, a really important question, Paul. The, and I, I expect that within the next, before the end of this decade, we will have measured directly for the first time gravitational waves. However, it's a very uh, complex question to answer because it depends on a number of things. Statistics, for example, we're not really sure how many of the binary neutron in star in spirals are out there. And every time a new in spiral is discovered, our statistics get better and better. But if we take that into account, we're, pretty, we're very certain of the, of the waveform that will be generated. So it's just how many are out there. With our current estimates, I think we've got a better than 75% chance of seeing gravitational waves by the end of this decade. So this is from inspiraling neutron from inspiring stars neutron as they, stars. they meet their doom in that last few yes. minutes or seconds as they yeah. go all the way in. Yes, the, uh, the signal is a chirp. It uh, starts off at the low frequencies and it finishes at about a kilohertz, so it goes and that's the end of the, the collision. And these two neutron stars merge. What comes out of it? Probably a black hole, which is also vibrating and generating its own gravitational waves. But that mess that comes out of gravitational waves has so much information in it that recording and understanding that information will tell us a lot about those systems. So these discoveries will be made with presumably advanced LIGO. Um, are there other experiments out there with different technologies to try and measure gravity waves? Yes, well, just like the electromagnetic spectrum, which covers many orders of magnitude, so does the gravitational wave spectrum. From the very, very low frequencies up to the audio band, and some people believe into the megahertz frequencies. The very, very low frequencies is pretty, pretty famous over the last year because that's the subject of the BICEP2 experiments as to whether there's a signature of inflation built in these gravitational waves from the early universe. At around the nanohertz, we're looking at uh, what are called pulsar timing arrays. These uh, you measure the effect that a par on a passing gravitational wave has on a spinning neutron star. And by measuring the effect of a wave has on a group of spinning neutron stars throughout the universe, we can measure gravitational waves using that effect. That's in this nanohertz band where Australia is pretty famous with the Parkes Pulsar Timing Array for that sort of work. Yes, yeah, so the, the BICEP2 um, frequencies you're talking about uh, wavelengths of billions of light years. Yes. And so you're never going to measure them directly. The entire galaxy is being moved around. So unless you could, um, the way we measure them in, in the microwave background, these nanohertz ones, we, we might move the entire Earth, but we can measure the position of the Earth relative to these distant to pulsars. The distant pulsars. You're not going to see the distortion within the Earth no, from those it's things. No, it's a unique s signature that comes from this this uh, change that we see by, um, by looking at those um, pulsar residuals that come out of the experiment. The, the timing, the changes in the timing, that's where the signal's going to be. There's still a large frequency range between nanohertz and the megahertz you've been talking about. Yes, there is, and in that space there's something called the uh, space antennas. LISA is the most well-known. This is a, a group of three satellites which are flown in, in the, around the Earth and their arm length separation is 5 million kilometres. You, know, I mean, you might recall that I said this, what we're trying to measure is a strain, which is a change in length divided by length. So the much longer the length, the much better we're able to make that measurement. So if we can go to space, we can have not 4 kilometre lengths, such as the LIGO, but we can have 5 million kilometre lengths. And there we're looking at the, the millihertz band, which is the band where there are things like white dwarf bi binaries. Now the LISA, the spaced antennas, could almost be confusion limited by the number of sources of gravitational waves that they will see. We're so confident that you know, if, if LISA flew and didn't see gravitational waves, general relativity would be well and truly on the, on the edge of disaster. So do you think LISA is going to fly, and if so, when? Well, LISA has a launch date, a European launch date of 2034. So it's a long way from now. Hopefully we will have been observing gravitational waves on the Earth for 17 years before then. So for these ground-based experiments at the higher frequencies, uh, you've said that advanced LIGO should be able to pick up at least a handful of these chirps over the next decade or so. Uh, where to from then? That'll be very interesting in itself, but do you think that uh, we'll be able to get several orders of magnitude more sensitivity and start picking up things further and other things? Well, the, the chirp is, the, the in-spiral is only one of the, of the sources we're looking at, of course. There are, four types of sources. So one of the sources is stochastic backgrounds. We'll be looking with LIGO for 
stochastic, perhaps more like foregrounds. We're going to be looking at uh, not at the primordial stochastic background, but other backgrounds that might be out there. We're looking at spinning neutron stars. Cumulative effect of vast numbers of chirps and things like that. Or? Yes, yes. So we, so with that, then there's the the actual CW sources. The neutron star spins emits gravitational waves. Okay. How big that wave is depend on how big the bump might be on a neutron star. Well, you don't know so that. So perfectly spherical, there won't sure. be anything. But if there's a that's mountain right. which it's might be like a millimetre high or something, yeah. then that spinning around will generate gravity mm -hmm. waves. But if we once we measure that that uh, that signal, we can then understand the the equation of state of the of the crust because that's what has to distort to give us our waves. We then have uh, other sorts of bursts the the that we're looking for. The supernova is a classic example. Now, supernova such a complicated thing that we really don't know what the shape of the signal is going to be, but if it's an asymmetric collapse in a supernova, we'll pick that up. So these are the types of sources which a ground-based detector is going after. With LIGO, we might see two or three sources, with advanced LIGO, two or three sources a year. So we have plans to improve that sensitivity by a factor of 10. How are we going to do that? Well, we, we need to use quantum states of light, That's which is one of the necessary methods. We'll probably need to cool the mirrors down to get rid of th thermal noise. We'll need to use uh, better suspension systems, uh, higher quality coatings, all these technologies which are doing what advanced LIGO does better and better. But we, the, uh, the quantum effects on this are going to, be to mean that we're going to put mirrors which are 40, 50 kilogram scale size into quantum states. So we're going to be, to be able to measure gravitational waves with massive objects, 40 kilometer long instruments, measuring the weakest signals in the universe, generated by the most violent events, limited by quantum mechanics. Now that's a fantastic field of research. Sounds like fun.